thank you very much. Thank you for the organizer, to the organizers. And thank you, uh, Alexander, for introducing that sampling theory can be used in inverse problems to assess the resolution when you have to do discrete sampling. Another application is if you do discrete sampling, sampling theorems may allow you to in interpolate with high accuracy data that you could not sample. So the current work is not directly about tomography, it's uh, going back to uh, sampling theory pure. It is together with Hussein Al-Hamali, who is currently at the Jeju Technical Institute in Tashkent. And we look at the one-dimensional case. And let me begin with the very classical case. So let the Paley-Wiener space PW pi 2 denote the space of square integrable pi band limited functions uh, given in this definition here. So basically these uh, Paley-Wiener functions are inverse Fourier transforms of square integrable functions with support in the interval minus pi pi. The classical sampling theorem then asserts for any such Paley-Wiener function, it can be expressed as what's called the cardinal series. So f is entirely determined by its samples on the integers and the reconstruction is furnished by the cardinal series, which converges absolutely in the L2 sense and uniformly on the real line. So we had in mind some desirable extensions. First, a larger class of admissible functions than just Paley-Wiener functions. Second, the cardinal series is numerically hardly used because people uh, say it converges uh, slowly if f doesn't decay very fast, which makes it unpractical. And I'll show an experiment later to illustrate this problem. So we want to improve the slow convergence of the truncated series, fk of t, where we cut off the series at minus k and k and make it a finite sum. So we want to improve the convergence of fk of t to the exact function f of t as k goes to infinity, when we restrict t to a finite interval. Another extension we desire is greater freedom in choosing the sampling points. We would like to liberate ourselves from the integers and ideally sample wherever we want. So this talk will attempt to introduce a framework that to some degree will allow to achieve all of these three goals and is a, co a coherent framework. So our the functions we consider will be functions of polynomial growth on the real line, still bent limited functions. So the distribution of Fourier transforms of these functions will still have support in the interval minus pi pi. Our method to achieve faster convergence consists in taking a few, like a few, like one, two or three, say, additional samples of f and or the derivative of f. And we will uh, consider a large class of non-equidistant sampling sets namely those that are certain perturbations of zero sets of sign type functions. And I hope I can do it in a way that you don't even have to know what a sign type function is to apply these theorems because the goal is if it is to be applied, it has to be easy to check if a certain set qualifies or not. So we begin with the larger class of admissible functions. 
And this is furnished by an alternative perspective on bent limited functions. There is an equivalent characterization. You can say one characterization is a bent limited function is a function whose distributional Fourier transform has compact support. An equivalent characterization is a bent limited function is an entire function that satisfies a certain growth condition. And the growth condition is equation two on this slide. So we see if we are on the real line, then the imaginary part of Z is zero and the function may grow polynomially. In the complex plane, it uh, may grow as a polynomial times e to the pi times the absolute value of the imaginary part of Z. So it turns out by the Paley-Wiener-Schwarz theorem that all functions in B pi n are pi band limited. And conversely, B pi n includes all pi band limited functions whose distributional Fourier transforms are distributions of order n. Our Paley-Wiener functions are contained in B pi n for any non-negative integer n. And obviously the B pi n's are nested, so the greater B pi n's for greater n contain the spaces for smaller n. So then we will need additional number of sampling points depending uh, to compensate for possible co polynomial growth as well as to increase convergence. The minimum number that we need for a given function in B pi n we denote by m sub f. And m sub f is the smallest non-negative integer such that f of x times one plus absolute value x to the minus mf is a square integrable function. It turns out that this minimum number of uh, samples requires will never exceed n plus one if f is in our space b pi n. And again, b pi n is the space of bent limited functions that grow like polynomial at most as polynomials of degree n on the real line. So let me just jump in and uh, treat the case of uniform sampling and present what we got. So let f be uh, in b pi n. Let m be the number of additional samples that we are taking that should be greater or equal the minimum mf. And let mu1 to mu m be distinct non-integer points. Those are the points where we take the additional samples in addition to sampling as at the integer. So when I say uniform sampling, I mean sampling at the integers in this case, or sometimes a shifted copy of the integers, but let's say the integers. So then we form from these additional samples a polynomial P mu, which is just the product of Z minus mu L when L goes from one to M. So P mu is the polynomial of degree M that has zeros at our additional sampling points. Dm is a constant given here. And then we can represent f in p pi n as p mu of z multiplied two terms. One is a finite sum that includes our additional samples at the point mu m. The other looks like the formula of the classical sampling theorem, only now a P mu of K appears in the denominator here. And of course, this sum gets also multiplied by P mu of Z. And we get uniform convergence on compact subsets of uh, the complex numbers. So what are the possible advantages here? Well, one is obvious. We have extended from Paley-Wiener functions to bent limited functions of polynomial growth. Another advantage is numerical, say you take M greater than you really need. 
so strictly greater mf. Then your series, which was slow converging before, now has a p mu of k in the denominator. So that term will grow as k to the m and increase potentially the uh, convergence speed of the series and decrease the truncation error if this infinite series is truncated. The proof of this theorem is inspired by papers by Gilbert Walter, who appeared in the late 80s and early 90s. A paper by Shin et al has a very similar result used with a completely different proof based on contour integrals. And yeah, so their paper will have some but not complete overlap with what uh, we will present today. It has re received little attention and may deserve uh, more. So let's uh, do some numerical considerations. Our truncated function f k of z is obtained by truncating the infinite series at k. And our goal is to reconstruct in a finite interval a, b. So we look at the maximum error depending on the cutoff value capital K in the finite interval a, b. So that is the maximum of the difference between the exact value f of x and the reconstructed value f k of x. Now let's make a rule of thumb prediction about convergence speed. If we know, say, f of x absolute value behaves like O of absolute value x to the alpha as absolute value x goes to infinity, then we know p mu of k absolute value is an O of absolute value k to the m. Then f of k divided by p mu of k decays like O of alpha to the O of capital or O of little k to the alpha minus m. And we get another factor k in the denominator from the z minus k. That factor will be compensated because we have uh, an infinite uh, series. So the rule of thumb is we, accept, we expect the truncation error to go down like O of k to the alpha minus m. So if we increase m, say by one, taking one more additional sample, we would already get significantly faster convergence. And as we will see, this is exactly what turns out in the numerical experiments. So then we need a class of bent limited functions to do our experiments with. And I restrict myself here to uh, Bessel functions j nu of pi z divided by pi z to the nu, and I will say y. So nu is greater than minus a half. We get a whole family of functions. The prefactor uh, normalizes it so the maximum of this function on the real line will be attained at zero, and it will be one. For nu equal one half, we get the sinc function sine pi x over pi x. Then for real x, the behavior at infinity is uh, like O of absolute value x to the minus nu minus a half. And importantly, we have the Fourier transform is a constant times one minus psi over pi squared to the nu minus a half. In particular, if we choose new less than a half, which we will do in our experiments, then the Fourier transform will be unbounded near the bent limit of pi and minus pi, which makes this exper uh, experiment numerically more challenging than when it's kind of going to zero or already zero. So the first uh, experiment involves the function f of x is f nu of x, a, a shifted copy of this f nu that I just introduced. So I wanted to break symmetry. So it's shifted out of the origin 
the shift is a non-integer because I'm sampling at the integer. I take new equal to be 0.1. So the function will decay at infinity like absolute value x to the minus 0.6, which makes it in L2, but barely so. So it's a not a very fast decaying function. And I reconstruct in the interval a, b is minus 20, 20. And I uh, plot here the logs of the maximum error ek versus uh, the logs of the cutoff value capital K. The upper curve here, hopefully not to find the yellow pluses are the classical sampling theorem that can be applied to this function. It is in L2, but this illustrates a very slow convergence that can happen. Yes, it converges, but say if you wanted an error of 10 to the minus four in the interval minus 20, 20, you have to take samples well, I stopped here at maybe 40, k okay, equal 40,000. So you are sampling at the integers. You have to sample way out to 40,000 and you don't even get uh, an error of 10 to the minus four. This illustrates that the cardinal series is unpopular for numerical applications. The red curve is one additional sample taking, taken at the point 10.5 and we see the errors decay much faster. And well, we go from 40,000 to 1,000 points to reach an error of 10 to the minus four. If it's still not great, but much better, the blue curve is two additional samples. So we retain the first one, we added one at minus 15.3. And now actually we obtain an error less than 10 to the minus four, already around K equals 60. So that looks much more practical. And it illustrates just taking two more samples gives better results than taking thousands of additional samples with the classical sampling theory. Now I would like to change my, yeah, okay, it works. So let's briefly discuss some ideas of the proof. We look at QM, which is the interp, the polynomial of degree at most m minus one that interpolates the functions at the additional sampling points. Then a key observation is that the auxiliary function capital G of Z is f of Z minus QM of Z divided by P mu of Z is in the Paley-Wiener space and we can apply the classical sampling theorem to it. If we do this and solve this again for f of z, we get f of z is represented as qm of z plus p mu of z g of z. g of z is now represented by the cardinal series, which gives this expression for f, which is um, not as useful as we want it to be because this QM will compensate largely the decay of the PMU. So we don't get this improvement of the convergence speed by increasing M because the QM gets larger as well. So the next step is to get rid of the QM in this formula and excuse me, and to actually show that the expressions involving the QM can be expressed in terms of the additional samples as a finite sum and therefore no longer influence the convergence of the infinite series. So this proof builds on initial ideas that we found in uh, the paper by Walter. 
so our next goal is to take this to non-equidistant sampling and free ourselves from just sampling at the integers. And that requires some, a little bit of theoretical build up. So common sampling sets used in practice include equidistant sets and non-equidistant but periodic sets. Both are zero sets of so-called pi sine type functions. The fundamental example of a pi sine type function is phi of z is sine of pi z and the set of zero are the integers. Then a periodic set which is a union of shifted copy of uh, integer capital J, J times Z, where the shifts X sub J should be distinct and in the half in open interval from zero to J, is again a zero set of a pi sine type function, which is now a product of shifted copies of sine pi z over j. So these are two fundamental examples of zero sets of pi sine type functions. The uh, exact definition for completeness, an entire function is said to be a pi sine type function if f is of exponential type at most pi, which is one sort of growth condition. Then the second condition is another growth condition, which in particular implies that all zeros of f must lie in the complex plane in a horizontal strip of finite height. And so the uh, imaginary parts of the zeros is uh, bounded. And we demand that the zeros of f are simple and separated. So that's the pi sine type function, but we can just think of the two examples I gave, the integers and the periodic sets for now. Then a zero set of pi sine type functions. So in general, we can define a canonical product uh, related to a discrete set lambda in a formal way. In this way, phi of z is a limit n to infinity product of absolute value k less than n one minus z over lambda k. Or lambda k is an element of our set. If lambda k happens to be zero, the factor of one minus z over lambda k is replaced by z. So if lambda is the integers, the canonical product is phi of z one over pi is equals one over pi times sine pi z. The problem with this infinite product is if we are looking at a set lambda, it may not be immediately obvious whether or not this formal canonical product four yields a well-defined function with properties that we desire. So we need some practically useful criteria that, that one can check without being a specialist and without investing a lot of time. Fortunately, such criteria exist. There is a result by Levin of Strofsky that if we have a uniformly discrete set, lambda k, k and z, a subset of the complex numbers, that satisfies the following, if the absolute value lambda k minus lambda k star to summed up to, to the power p and then summed over z is finite, where lambda k star is a zero set of a pi sine type function, then the canonical product four again defines a pi sine type function. So practically, in particular, moving finitely many zeros of a pi sine type function, if we have one without creating any multiple zeros, so our set should still be uniformly discrete, we still have another pi sine type function. So any theory about zero sets of pi sine type function allows us to change finitely many um, elements in our sampling set. And since in practice, we 
only sample at finitely many places. This basically tells us theoretically we can do whatever we want and sample wherever we like. Of course, this will be subject to numerical stability in practice, but theoretically this gives really great freedom. Furthermore, we can perturb zero sets of pi sine type functions and uh, still stay in a class of sampling set where we can reconstruct uh, and perturb them in a way different from the Levin Ostrovsky. Namely, we can allow constant perturbations or up to perturbations up to a constant, so the perturbation doesn't have to go to zero as uh, k goes very large. So the most commonly known example is for the integers. So that if the reference set is the integers, we can define a set lambda k. A lambda is lambda k, k and z, so that each lambda k differs from k itself at most by a constant d, then we say lambda is in the class S sub d of z or a d perturbation of the integers. And now the next step is to replace the integers by the zero set of a pi sine type function. This gives us our definition and the full class of our sampling set. So let lambda star be a reference set, namely the zero set of some pi sine type function. And we say that the sampling set lambda, which is lambda k, k and z, lies in the class SD of lambda star. If the imaginary parts of the lambda k form a bounded set, and the real part of lambda k differs from the real part of lambda k star at most by d times the minimum distance of the real parts of two sets of two points in the set lambda star. So if lambda star is the integers, this minimum would be one. If lambda star is a non-equidistant set with the same average density, this minimum will be less than one. Finally, we denote S by SD, the family of all sets lambda that are D perturbations for some zero set lambda star of a pi sine type function. So then, we have this useful result that if lambda is in this class of d perturbations of pi sine type functions and d is less than a quarter, then the canonical product is a well-defined function and it lies in our space b pi n for n equal one. Now to get to our interpolation formula, the sampling theorem is really a form of Lagrange interpolation. And for Lagrange interpolation, you need a class of functions that is one, that equals one at one of your sampling points and zero at all of the others. And these are what we denote by phi sub k of c. And they are constructed by taking our canonical product phi of z and dividing it by z minus lambda k times phi prime of lambda k. And at the point lambda k itself, we take the limit z to lambda k phi k of z, and this will be one. And then the result is this phi k is a Bailey-Wiener function uh, for all k. So these are Bailey-Wiener functions in the Bailey-Wiener space and they are our Lagrange interpolating functions. And this allows us to state the non-equidistant uh, version of the classical sampling theorem for uh, samples, sampling sets lambda and S sub D. And this theorem was published uh, last year in applicable analysis. 
Let f be uh, in the bailey Wiener space. Let lambda be in SD with D less than a quarter. Then f of C can be reconstructed by some k in Z, f of lambda k phi k of Z. This series converges in L2 of A and uniform of R, L2 of R, and uniformly on any horizontal strip in the complex plane, the, but a horizontal strip of finite uh, height, I would say, rather than width. Now, surveying the literature on, so what is new here if, if we have, a, if the, Lambda is in SD of the integers, then this is known. So the new part is we can go from perturbing the integers to perturbing any zero set of the finite, uh, of a pi sign type function. Now the literature on long equidistant sampling I found is rich in theory and uh, thin on examples. So I want to make sure this, uh, there are actually examples where this applies. It's not just a formula. So first we put our classical sampling theorem in this context. So if we take our sampling set lambda to be the integers and the phi is one over pi sine pi z, and the phi k of z is the well, turns out to be the well known uh, sine pi z minus k over pi times z minus k or short sinc, cardinal sine of z minus k. Then here's an example where we modify the integers that follows. We leave zero and the positive integers intact and we shift the negative integers by a constant one minus b. And of course we want to be one minus b less than a quarter. Then the canonical product can be uh, written down uh, in terms of the gamma function. And in order to apply this uh, theorem going back, the key is you need some manageable formula for this phi k, which is defined via the canonical product of your sampling set. Uh, so having examples for that will be important for practical applications. Another example, still a perturbation of the integers. If you set a parameter nu between zero and one and choose as your sampling set, the union of the zero set of the Bessel function J nu and the set containing zero, this sampling set will be in SD of Z for some D with D less than a quarter. You can use it in the sampling theorem with phi being J nu of pi Z times pi z to the one minus nu. So basically you can sample a function at the zeros of a Bessel function j nu and reconstruct uh, it with our theorem. One could then say, well, these zeros, I don't know the zeros of the Bessel function j nu by heart. That is true. But a very good first approximation formula exists and a couple of Newton steps will give you this zero to any desired accuracy. So as soon as uh, you work uh, on a computer that can evaluate J nu, then you are in business here. Yeah? So that's numerically not really a restriction. And I was very surprised to not yet have found this example in the literature. Finally, as already mentioned, if lambda is a periodic set, then uh, the canonical product is a pi sine type function. And those are not, this is not a perturbation of the integers that is not contained in a framework uh, of sampling that only considers small perturbation of the integers. Periodic sets have of course been treated separately, but this in the past, but this framework puts it all together with uh, the integers uh, in a unified way. And we can still perturb uh, such uh, sets 
uh, and get something. Periodic sets are practically useful if you want sampling sets that have larger gaps. So the general non-existent version of our sampling theorem for f in b by n, so taking the result from the bailey wiener space to functions with polynomial growth, and allowing for oversampling by finitely many points is this. We take a sampling set in our class ST with D less than a quarter. We take capital M additional samples that should be at least as many as the minimum number MF defined before. Let mu1 to mu m be distinct points not contained in our sampling set lambda. Let P mu of C be as before the product of C minus mu L, L equal one to M, and phi the canonical product corresponding to lambda. Then capital F of C is the contribution of the additional samples and the reconstruction formula is F of C is capital F of C plus the polynomial P mu times limit k to infinity, sum minus k to k, f of lambda k divided by p mu of lambda k times the phi k of z discussed before, with uniform convergence over compact subsets of the complex numbers. Again, we expect more rapid convergence because we have the factor p mu of lambda k in the denominator. So now I want to make good on the promise that we can actually move finitely many points as we wish and not just one or two. So I said I'm going to sample this function at 2001 points and I move all of them. So we take as reference uh, the integers, but we will move all the 2001 points where we will uh, sample or or well, actually, I will show examples with less than 2001 points used where all the points are moved and also with more, but we cut off the variations at 2001 points. We take a function that has polynomial growth, x squared f nu. So instead, the function now grows like, and the nu is now positive. So the function grows like x to the 1.1. So we have a function in b pi 2. We could take m equal 3. Maybe my experiment has more cases, so let's wait with that. The, lamb, the sampling set is the integers, but we replace the integers between minus 1,000 and 1,000 by perturbations by moving them randomly by an amount of at most 0.245, which is a little less than a quarter. And the resulting canonical product is the canonical product for the integer times the correction term that accounts for the places that have been moved. So the x minus k in the denominator divides out the zero of sine pi x that we no longer need. And the x minus lambda k in the numerator puts in the new zero that we want. Now the derivatives, which we need to get the Lagrange interpolating functions phi k, phi k we need phi prime of lambda k, those are computed numerically. We again do reconstruction in the interval minus 2020. Our function to be reconstructed uh, looks like in the upper left, the canonical product here plotted in the interval minus 2020 is in the upper right. And we see our error decays for m equals three, just as the expected uh, order of uh, 1.1 minus m. 
Finally, we want to sample with uh, gaps. So we uh, do an experiment on this uh, same function with periodic samples, which are indicated in black here. So you see the black samples come in groups of five with relatively large gaps in between them. In particular, there is no sample where the big peak of this function is. And our additional samples are all concentrated in a very small interval around uh, zero in this case. And M equals three was uh, maybe the minimal choice here. And M equal four is one additional sample. And again, we see that one additional sample gets a substantial increase in the convergence speed, just as expected uh, with O of uh, capital K to the alpha minus M. So let me discuss some references. As I mentioned, uh, the work is inspired by Walter. It has partial overlap with earlier work by Shin in the results, but not in the methods of proof. Uh, my paper with Hussein Alamali was the non-equidistant sampling theorem for the Paley-Wiener space. Rome and Walnut give a very nice uh, discussion of sampling on unions of shifted lattices, which includes periodic uh, sampling, and also an introduction to the theory underlying uh, the non-equidistant sampling theorem. Higgins did pioneering work on non-equidistant sampling by sampling theorems by perturbing the integers. Uh, Zeib in extended Higgins result to functions that are bounded on the real line, but not necessarily L2. Uh, Levine and Ostrovsky are already mentioned, very important for the practical applications of our results because we know how we can perturb. And Zayed and Garcia, as well as Flornes, Lubarsky and Zeib, uh, use an alternative method to accelerate convergence, which consists in not in taking a few additional samples, but in either uh, restricting the function to a smaller bandwidth or alternatively increasing the sampling rate, which is a more established method than what we suggest here to just take a few additional samples. So let me conclude here and thank you for your attention.